Hello and welcome. Yes, thank God we finally made it. It's game week, baby. Oh, I'm juiced. Here we are. Welcome to another episode of Inside the Borough, uh, the podcast for and by FAU fans, presented by the FAU Owls Nest. Oh, man, I've been waiting this one for a long, long while. Um, we made we got, it. <laughs> we, we, we made it, brother. We made it. Jake Elman here. Uh, and we're, we're going to have a, uh, a really fun special guest, uh, Zach Goodall, who covers UF or SI on in a bit. Uh, but hey, man, before we actually really get started into game week talk, I thought that was what this whole episode was going to be. But no, 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 not quite. 3 p.m. Sunday. Boom. Dropped a bomb after we've been trying to pry this answer out of Coach Taggart. Uh Offensive coordinator Johnson and everyone for for so long now. But FAU finally has their QB1. Nicozy Perry, congratulations. It's all on him. The University of Miami, Jake is clapping. (laughs) The the, the University of Miami transfer, uh, he was named QB1 uh, about 24 hours ago, recording this um, Monday afternoon. And it, it, it made national headlines to a point, at least regional headlines. You could see the UM fans had a reaction to it. Florida Gator fans had a reaction to it. So uh, very, very interesting to see. Jake, let's, let's start it off with, with this brother. Let's uh, get it going. What do you think about the decision? Obviously I want to preface this with, we have not been out there and nobody has been at scrimmages outside of the people who draw a check from the university or or players. So you know, we really didn't have a realistic idea of how well Perry was playing, of how well Nick Trani was playing in his second year under Tagger. But I was a little surprised because I, I had spent the summer thinking, you know, look, Nikosi Perry wasn't here in the spring. Trani was. I thought there was value in saying, let's play it safe. Let's start Trani in, in UF. Let's start him to start non-conference play. Bring Perry in. At some point in UF, assuming that game is out of hand, let's say to start the second half, bring Perry in against Fordham because you're assuming that that game should be out of hand to start the second half in favor of FAU. And then either before Air Force or before FIU, which is the Conference USA opener, you say, well, should we go with Tron or should we go with Perry? But once I saw the announcement, I thought, you know what, this makes sense. I think Perry is somebody who obviously has a proven talent. We know how well he played at UF. And I think I made the argument on the last episode we did, the first episode of this season, which was, you know, if he plays half as well as he did at U, at excuse me, at UM, you know, that's more than good enough for Conference USA. That's good enough to win. I had FAU as seven or eight win team. Before then, now, I'll admit it. I'm starting to think 10 – might be a bit high, but you know, I think nine is definitely more realistic if Perry plays as well as he can, as well as, well as we know that he has the talent to do. Oh, and you know what, Jake? The, the, the schedule is actually, I think, quite favorable in that direction, considering who we play at home, especially in conference play. Uh, but we'll, we'll get to that in a second, Al fans. So it's going to be exciting. We're going to do a little, I guess, a season preview, if you will, after we have uh, Zach on, but, but going back to the quarterback talk, uh, I, I, I also agree with you. I, I think we were going to get Tronti just because he knows the playbook a little bit more than anyone else. He has literally lived the playbook, uh, getting most of the starts last year. Uh, I'm a bit surprised we didn't see more of Johnson jr. In the final week and a half, two weeks leading up to this moment, but it was interesting. Uh, Coach Taggart in a teleconference uh, this morning, we're recording this again on, on Monday. Um, he said that Perry handles himself different. You, you can tell that he comes from a big time program like UM. And, and, and I, I'm, what I'm taking from that is that you can see his work ethic. Uh, just because he hasn't been here as long as everyone else, you can tell the fact that he's won the starting job, that he has studied the crap out of the playbook. And on top of that, he's a very athletic player. He's a good quarterback. 
But being able to overtake Tronti and, and all the time he had uh, when it comes to the book, I, I, I think that stands out to me the most. Uh, we'll see how well he can recall the book when he's under the lights, prime time at the swamp. Uh, that will be quite the test. But holy smokes, I'm kind of excited now. I mean, you have to think he is going to be the most athletic, most talented quarterback that FAU has right now. And that's no disrespect to the other guys. Um, we, know, we know Posey can, can run anyone off the field. We, we know Tronti. I mean, we've seen his drives, you know, two-minute warnings. You can say four-minute drives even um, in seasons past and what, what he can do. And I'm very excited for Johnson uh, in the future. But if, if, if we're going to do this against UF, we're going to go big. Let's 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 go big. Let's do it. What do we have to lose? What? Did, yeah, did, did, I, not covered. Okay. No, I I mean that was my takeaway in the minutes right after. I thought to myself, Taggart's going for it. And I think if you talk to most football fans, they'd say, well, of course a G five coach is going to go for it against an SEC team. They want to win. Well, you know, I I think there's a difference between going for it and starting who you think is the best who had the best camp Perry's our guy and I think that's something that FAU fans should want to hear after what they went through last year and I think as time goes on you start looking back at last year and you say that the issue was you had Trani and then you really didn't have a traditional quarterback behind him you had Agner who was a walk-on you had Posey who is now playing I don't know if he's officially playing receiver there he's officially a gadget player more or less. You had Taggart Jr. who played some quarterback, played some receiver, played some returner at one point. You didn't have, you know, I know we like to really praise Chris Robinson, but you didn't have somebody who was a Chris Robinson. You didn't have a Driscoll. You didn't have somebody waiting in the wings that Trani had a slow start that you could turn it over to somebody who'd been in the system for a year or two and that you could say, hey, we want you to be the guy long term, but we need you to take over now and beat teams with your arm and with your legs or with your arm and your decision making. When Posey came in and he was playing great, he was beating teams with his legs. He was he was completing some passes, but he wasn't the passer that FAU needed. And he got exposed for that as time went on. So if Perry can be that traditional quarterback or whatever a traditional quarterback is in 2021, athletic. Smart decision making, you know, not throwing bad, not making bad decisions, not throwing stupid passes, not rushing plays. Somebody who can beat you with a slant or who can throw a 20 yard deep ball or who can take advantage of a short route and give it to LeJonte Western and turn a three yard gain into 15 yards. That's what FAU needs. And I think that's what Perry is going to give them. Going back to your point about how last year, you know, it was just, Tronti's job to lose. I mean, mainly because of the situation with, with Robinson, but I mean, do, do you, I feel like we talked about this so much last year about not having a, you know, any spring. I mean, do you think that was a developmental issue? Do you think that might've been something looking in the wrong direction with recruiting? Because I mean, we, we've had a good amount of quarterbacks that have committed to FAU and maybe come to FAU for a little bit and then haven't panned out. What, out of those two options, which one do you think might be the biggest issue there? Me personally, I think it's recruiting. I think it's, you know, and I'm going to try to be nice here. Since 2017, excuse me, since 2016, these are the quarterbacks you've signed because Daniel Parr, who played well at times when he started and he went to Duquesne and he was great there. You signed Stephen Frank in 2016. Well, you know, he left the program in 2017. Then you sign Cordell Littlejohn, who's now in his third position. Then you sign Posey, who's now a gadget player. He didn't sign a high school quarterback in 2018. They brought Rafe Peavy in as a grad transfer later, and he didn't play well when given opportunities. Then last year, you signed Willie Taggart Jr. We don't know what Willie Jr.'s future is. He could be a quarterback. He says he's a quarterback. He could be, for all we know, he could be a receiver. He could be a running back at some point. We don't know. But you didn't have a guy who you signed in 2018 who by 2020 was in his third year with the program who you could say, all right, Nick is not playing at the level we need him to. Let's turn it over to this guy. You didn't have that. 
junior college guy that you brought in in 2019. You had Agner, but Agner was never realistically a factor. You didn't have that guy who you could throw in. And I don't know how much of that is because of COVID and how much of that is different recruiting philosophies, but that's what makes me excited about the quarterback room now. We don't know if the Kosey Perry is going to be here next year. COVID has totally destroyed my understanding of eligibility. There's guys in the roster listed as redshirt freshmen who might be in their fourth year, not just the FAU, but all over the country because everything's all weird. So even if you don't have Perry next year, and you never know what's going to happen with Trani in the era of the transfer portal. And I think he graduates soon. So whatever. Well, you're going to have Michael Johnson Jr. Who's going to be in his second year in the system. And the junior is still a quarterback. You're going to have him who's entering his third year. So whoever your quarterback is next year, assuming both of those guys are here, again, nothing's ever certain in the transfer portal era, you can say, okay, we're going to start Michael Johnson Jr. next year. Okay, you know, we're not seeing what we want for Mike, or, you know, let's give Willie Jr. some reps. Well, they've been in the system, taking snaps, working with the coaches, not switching positions full time the way that Cordell Little John did, the way it seems JV on Posey did, that you have guys that you're developing. And that's what gets me excited, and that's what makes me frustrated in hindsight about last year. I, I do wonder if if we did have a spring ball, though, then maybe it wouldn't have been such a rough start, especially in the quarterback room, you know, with, with a new scheme and all. And again, we've beaten the crap out of this dead horse uh, over the last 365 days. But uh, I have to think that's something. And, and, and we can see that Tronti has gotten better. You know, he used to be, you know, strictly that, that four minute drive four minute offense type of guy we've seen that over the years and you can see him progressively get better uh moments of camp that we could see we could see him string along some impressive passes so he's definitely gotten better at, at throwing the ball down the field and we've already known that he's a really solid strong runner so uh on top of that i mean if if we're gonna go to perry with tronti getting better year after year after year i think that has to bode well uh, for us. And then you have the young guys. So I look at this year as, you know what, it's win now. And I think for a team like FAU's caliber, they're not UCF yet. They may never be UCF, but FAU is talented enough that, yeah, every year should be win now. We're not going to rebuild. We're not saying six should be the goal. Eight or nine should be the goal. Conference title should be the goal. And if you're going to win a conference title, if you're going to win nine games, if you're going to play in the bowl game, which very well could be the bowl, bowl again, then you need a quarterback who's going to play well. I'm not saying light it up for 4,000 yards, 30 touchdowns, but you need somebody who can carry the offense competently. Jason Driscoll did it. Chris Robinson did it two years ago. I don't see what's stopping Nikosi Perry from doing it this year. And before, before we uh, have Zach come on, uh, Let's do make note that when Driscoll did it, I mean, remember, he was the third option at the start of the season. Right. So, I mean, th these things are fluid, but as Coach Taggart said uh, earlier this morning, and as you have alluded to, uh, we're not here to play musical chairs. Uh, we're here to win football games and play, play at a high level. Just play smart. Do what needs to be done. FAU's playing a 10-game season, and that's okay. You know, you're probably going to lose against UF. There's no shame in that. UF is a top 15 team in the country, and you're probably going to beat for them. So it's what you do in those other 10 games. If you go 5-5, five and five, that's a disappointment. If you go 7-3, and three, well, you're 8-4, and four, third straight winning season, fourth in five years, you're going to another bowl game. So is the Kosey Perry good enough to go seven and three in a 10 game season? I think so. So I'm optimistic. I'm not saying this is going to be 2017, 2018 UCF. I'm not saying it's going to be 2017 FAU, but my expectations for this team have only gone up as this year has progressed. All right. Well, uh, now that the quarterback talk is over with, we got another big story. That story is it is finally game week. Holy smokes. And I got to tell you guys, this is one that I think FAU fans, we've had circled on our calendar uh, hmm, since maybe 2015. 
Possibly. Eh, eh, we'll talk about it. Uh, so joining us to talk about UF, we have uh, Zach Goodall. Uh, he, he covers the Gators for Spills Illustrated. So uh, Zach, hey, partner, how you doing? Doing great, Jack. Thank you. Uh, thank you both for having me. I'm just as excited as you all are. Um, it's finally football season. This is what we look forward to. This is what we work for. Absolutely. And, and especially considering where we all were for the last year and a half, uh, this one feels like the real deal. So it's, it's good to see. Uh, but hey, let's dive into it, brother. Speaking of the real deal, why don't we talk about this little quarterback y'all got up there, Emery Jones. Uh, he played a bit last season, looked pretty solid, looked pretty solid, especially in the ground game. Would you mind elaborating a little bit on uh, what he has in his arsenal? Yeah, sure thing. He was, Emory Jones was Dan Mullen's first quarterback recruit coming to Florida. He flipped from Ohio State very shortly after Mullen had gotten the job. Uh, he's kind of viewed as the guy to start Dan Mullen's tenure whenever Felipe Franks was done. At that point, you know, Kyle Trask was still a two-star backup that no one thought was ever going to play. We all saw how that went. That turned into a really cool story. But regardless, everyone then suddenly forgot about Emory Jones, you know, a top 100 player in the class of 2018, and the guy that Dan Mullen targeted right off the bat. Uh, he, he's a very talented football player as a dual-threat athlete. He can run around uh, for a player that's not necessarily that – I don't want to sound weird saying this, but like thick, well-built. He's got a decent amount of power uh, to his game, but obviously it's his speed and elusiveness that can really give defenses fits. The question everyone has is how good is he as a passer? You know, we've seen him play a lot over the past three years in little spurts, coming for relief of Kyle Trask and uh, just doing a lot of different things in the offense. But at the same time, we never really got a flow for how he can throw the ball. He would throw maybe one or two passes on a given drive and be out for a couple more. You just – you know, you don't really know what you have at that point. So this game, the FAU game uh, and USF really for Florida is going to serve as an introduction as to what Emory Jones can do in this offense before, you know, Alabama rolls into town week three. And that's the biggest test of Emory Jones's career right then. Zach, as the offseason has gone on, what progressions have you been able to see in Emory Jones as a passer? I don't know how long you guys are out there each day or if the scrimmages have been open for as long as you might prefer, but you know, are you seeing improved accuracy? Are you seeing him hitting the receivers where, as opposed to maybe in the past, he wasn't? You know, I wish I could tell you, but that's the thing that about Florida is we don't even get the 20 minute sessions at the beginning of our practice just to do an injury report, much less see any scrimmages. So I've not, I've not personally seen him throw around myself beyond recruiting camps where he'll just kind of toss it and, I certainly see the power in his arm when he's just kind of messing around doing that. I think he throws a prettier ball than Kyle Trask in terms of going downfield. Um, there's a lot of power. The question is placement as well as the mental side of the game. It's kind of been the question for a couple of years now is where is he in terms of making quick decisions, making the right read and throwing an accurate football. And there's been spurts, you know, throughout his career so far, well, he'll drop a really pretty pass down the sideline in stride slant to the middle of the field and it, it's perfectly placed between two defenders. Again, it's just the issue of, is that going to be a consistent thing? Is that something that he can do on every time he drops back to throw the ball? We just don't know because we've not seen him under a ton of pressure, not seen him develop a rhythm at this point. So that's just, I wish I could give better answers than that, but that's exactly how Florida views this is at least these first couple of weeks to open the season. And then obviously the big test in Alabama is all of their questions about Emory Jones and how he's developed beyond what you can just do in a practice setting and beyond what you can do in a classroom. That's what these couple of games are going to tell us. Zach, it felt like whenever I watched UF last year, I did get to see parts of a few games that Kadarius Tony was always doing something. He could beat you as, your, as a traditional receiver he could beat you on kind of the gadget plays he could take a short pass and get 25 yards on you have they found somebody you know or do you think there's somebody on that offense that they could use that UF could use in a similar role I'm not saying beat Tony who obviously was a first round pick but who could kind of fill that void of somebody who is that gadget player who could do a lot of different things in an offense um I I like you said, no one can exactly be Tony because he just he can move like an alien. 
I mean, the way he could <laughs> just bend and contort his body to make a guy miss is unlike anything I had ever seen before. Um, I think if there's any player that you look at with the hopes he can be a Tony-like player, it's probably Jacob Copeland, uh, rising senior out of the Pensacola area, a highly coveted recruit in 2018. He's extremely athletic. He's run in the four fours before he can jump 37, 38 inches. So he, there aren't many athletes in Florida's offense that can move and do the things that Copeland can do as, a, as an athlete. That being said, Copeland's had some drop issues in the past. He's not the best route runner, although I'll give him the credit of his route running has improved every he's been at Florida. So if you're looking at anyone to step into Tony's role, be able to move outside, play the slot, take end arounds and get involved in the rushing game, it's probably Copeland. You just got to see where that development is. And to his credit, Kadarius Tony, his first three years, you saw some of the flashy plays, but they were never consistent. There were times where you would wonder, what's he doing? He just ran 10 yards backwards and it still gained two yards, which is pretty cool, but it was like, what was his thought process doing that? So maybe Copeland can kind of have the same thing where he breaks out as a senior. It just took time to develop like Tony did. But uh, Darius Tony, he was so unique and fun to watch. You know, it's, you it's may- funny. Oh, no, uh, I'm sorry, Jake. I, no, I no, sorry. Say- no, it's all right. Go, go. I, go. I, I was, get- was going to say, Zach, it's funny because I actually talked uh, during our teleconference with Coach Taggart today. We're recording this on Monday. Uh, I said, how happy are you that – you don't have to face against the likes of Kyle Pitts as well. Uh, and, and Coach Taggart said, I mean, I kind of wish that more guys went to the draft. If they could do a supplemental draft today, that would be wonderful because UF just oozes with talent. So I wanted to ask about UF's strengths because as Coach Taggart alluded to, there is a lot there. Uh, and maybe uh, a, a, a weakness that you can pinpoint that maybe FAU could exploit. Yeah, see, Florida recruits a lot of really great talent um, in terms of skill, t- skill players. Um, it wasn't so much there in the past couple of years at running back, but it, to supplement that, they brought in a couple of really talented transfers, Lorenzo Lingard from Miami, uh, Demarcus Bowman from Clemson. And at wide receiver, Billy Gonzalez, the receivers coach, uh, is really well respected for the way he's developed receivers in the past. So they may not necessarily be five stars, high four stars, but he can teach technique really well and unlock the athletic side of players that maybe they've not been able to find quite yet. And that's what does make Florida's development at receiver so dangerous. So the likes of Copeland uh, and Xavier Henderson down from your guys' area, more <clears throat> into Miami, I guess, with Columbus. Uh, he's a guy that's running the four fours, four fives before, and he's six foot four. Uh, there's always room for length in Florida's offense, and there isn't as much length at this point as there's been in the past. So there's certainly a, an opportunity for him to step in. Uh, you look at tight end, and even <laughs> it's that same type of thing. No one could ever replace a Kyle Pitts. But there was some production at the position last year when Pitts went out with a couple of injuries and opted out of the bowl game. So they, they like what they have in Kamora Gamble. They like what they have in Keon Zipper out of Lakeland. It's just, you know, you can't ever have the expectation someone's going to be like Pitts in that respect. If you look for weaknesses, I'd say it's probably the offensive line. There's a couple of guys on there that have looked solid in the past. That being said, there are some guys on there that have returned who look the opposite, and they're still penciled in the starters at this point, especially on the right side of the line. Uh, John Hevesy, the offensive line coach, to be kind, has struggled at recruiting offensive line talent over the past couple of years. Um, They've missed out particularly a lot at offensive tackle. And with that being said, the worst starter on the line is at right tackle. And they have a new starter at left tackle. Now he's someone that's played guard before and flex to tackle on a pinch in Richard Garage. And he's a solid player. But when you've got those two guys as your bookends right there, a new full-time left tackle paired with someone that gave up. I wish I had the numbers in front of me, but I wouldn't be exaggerating if I said over 50 quarterback pressures a year ago. It's just, that's immediately where my concern would be drawn to. Um, And I I would give a lot of teams, as long as they have a decent edge rushing package, a chance against Florida, if they're able to consistently get after the passer. Now, what will help 
is that Florida has a more mobile quarterback with Emory and Anthony uh, compared to Kyle Trask, who was never really all that fast, to put it kindly. I feel like that's bittersweet news for FAU then, because even though they lost Layden McCarthy, who signed with the Buccaneers as a free agent, and he had the hard problem, but you still bring back Jalen Joyner, the sack king. You bring back Chris Jones, who impressed as kind of a pass rush specialist last year. There's a couple other younger pass rushers who could step up. Chase Lassner, who played Mike last year, he moved outside. So, you know, that's the good news. Zach said that a team like that, you know, with the, with that depth can keep you in the game. But, you know, the other part of what he said is Emory Jones is so mobile that it's not like you're facing a statuesque quarterback like Trask and the guy who he's now sharing a quarterback room with, and Tom Brady. So, you know, Zach, if FAU is going to stay in the game, do you think that that's the way that they stay in the game is if they pressure uh, Emory Jones the way that, we haven't seen them pressure those power five quarterbacks before is get in somebody's face, get them to the ground, create some havoc in the backfield. Yeah, I certainly think so. Uh, it all goes back to the same thing about Emory Jones and where he's developed beyond having really fast legs and a really big arm. Uh, where is he at mentally? How does he handle pressure? And with, you know, these are college kids. I really want to be polite, but you know, a, a bit of a liability on at least the right side of the line, you know, if FAU is able to consistently create pressure off that side, this is going to be an immediate test for Emory Jones as to how he can handle pressure. You want to see him not panic into throwing passes, you know, as he's rolling and then do it to the opposite side, not trying to test double coverage when he's under pressure and stuff like that. Um, and if FAU can produce that type of pressure, suddenly Emory Jones is going to have to grow up very quickly. Since I just talked about FAU's defense, UF a couple of years ago came down to my area, Palm Beach County, and you guys took away Kyir Elam, his father. Abe Elam played on my Jets for a little bit. His uncle, Matt Elam, was at Dwyer, played for the Ravens for a little bit. How have you seen Kyir Elam's game grow over the last couple of years from when he came in very talented? I think he was a four-star on 247, four-star, maybe borderline five-star recruit somebody who's already popping up in mock drafts is somebody who could be the first or second cornerback off the board next spring. Yeah, I think he's gotten, I think he's unlocked a little bit more athleticism because when he came in, he was, he was already looking like a starting caliber cornerback just because he was like six foot two, 190 pounds and coming from the Miami area. Uh, but he wasn't the quickest. He needed to work on his hips to kind of unlock his abilities uh, in coverage, trailing a guy, sticking hip to hip with someone. He must have picked it up real quick because he comes in, he starts five games as a true freshman, and he looked like a seasoned veteran at that point. He's uh, intercepting, I think, one pass, maybe two passes during his uh, red shirt. No, his true freshman season. And I think the completion percentage he allowed in coverage was something in the 40s. It was just, it was... He looked like a junior who was about to go into the draft, not necessarily a true freshman. And, and we saw that last year as well. Florida's defense as a whole, like I said earlier, really was not any good. They struggled with communication in the secondary. And at the same time, no one ever even thought to lump Elam in with the crowd that was underperforming at that point. He's still ranked in like the top 10, top 15 in pass breakups. Still another season hovering around 50% completion percentage. He is, in my opinion, one of, if not the best man coverage cornerback in America. Um, and with the athleticism that he's continued to unlock, I truly think he can cover just about anyone that may, you know, he would struggle against the Jalen Waddles of the world, guys that can run 4-2, 4-3 range, just because that's not his style of game. He's physical, and then he can keep up with you after jamming you. And with that, as long as he's not facing, you know, one of the fastest receivers that you can find, he's going to find a way to lock him. All right. Well, now uh, the time that everyone has been waiting for. Zach, Jake, it's prediction time, boys. Uh, and Zach, don't don't feel like you need to be nice. All right, you, you are our guest. Uh, make yourself at home. So uh, just be be honest with us. Line is twenty four and a half in uh, UF's favor. Uh, what do you think your prediction final score will be Saturday night? See, I think it'll look as though Florida won handily, 
but I think FAU covers. You know, I think Florida's defense is going to be better this year, without a doubt. But that's not necessarily because I'm totally confident in the defense. It's more of a, it literally can't be any worse than it was last year type of deal. Um, and with that, you know, I think FAU has a very good chance of putting up 20 plus points if Perry can lead the program in the direction that Willie Tiger thinks that he can. Um, you know, he is still an experienced quarterback with power five um, experience under his belt. And Florida really struggled against quarterbacks last year that um, came in, weren't necessarily as heralded as others. Uh, we saw it with Max Johnson. Uh, we saw it with the Tennessee quarterback, Harris and Bailey, uh, when he came in. These quarterbacks were putting up, you know, 64, 65 percentage completion, a couple hundred yards, and were able to run the ball as well. And Florida just struggled with it. So while I anticipate Florida's defense being better, um, communicating better this year, it's the first game for a totally brand new look unit and FAU's got weapons. They've got a quarterback that they're confident in. And with that, you know, I could see it being 41 to 21 FAU getting into the 20 point range. Yeah. I think Zach is a little bit more optimistic than I am. I think the best case scenario for this game is a repeat of two years ago with Ohio state. It's going to look ugly early. The box score is going to tell one story. The line score is going to tell one story. But you watch the film, and it's going to tell a different story, where FAU's offense will start slow, and they'll play better as the game goes on. FAU's defense will start slow. They'll play better as the game goes on. I think if that happens, I'm predicting 45-14 UF. That's the boat I'm leaning in right now. I think worst case is Oklahoma. I think Emory Jones comes out of the gate early. I think he starts running all over FAU's defense, defense that we've talked up all offseason in large part because of how many veterans come back, which was the case three years ago when you only lost one starter after that 2017 team. You know, I'm not saying it will be 63-14, but it will definitely be a game that come 9 o'clock, FAU fans are saying, I'm done. I'm going to go watch whatever game is on ABC or ESPN. So best case, which is what I'm going to say, UF 45-14, worst case, I don't think we projected the score is worth it. UF 45-14. Uh, FAU will cover. I got 38-20. Um, could be a weird one late where I think UF will kind of just run away with it maybe in the fourth quarter. It could be a game in the third. Uh, oh God, Jake, you triggered me when you mentioned the Oklahoma game. Oh, man. That that one that one was brutal, but yeah, it will be a. I, I think it'll be a close one going into the final fifteen. But then UF will use their depth and just raw talent to pull away, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think that would be a a, a score line being proud over. All right. So all that being said, all that laid out there. Um, if you guys want to send your hate towards Jake, you already know where he's at. Um, but hey, Zach, why don't you go ahead and let uh, FAU fans uh, know where they can find you, uh, and particularly on Twitter. Yeah, sure thing. Uh, you guys can follow me on Twitter at Zach underscore Goodall, uh, spelled Z-A-C-H. We had that talk before the podcast started about how it's uh, spelled all over. Um, and I've got all my takes there about the Florida Gators, uh, about the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, because I cover them as well, and really any football that I can get my hands on. So I'm looking forward to chatting with some of you. There we go. Champa Bay. Love it. Well, uh, Zach, we will uh, we'll be seeing you on Twitter. I expect a lot of people to blow you up if FAU uh, does better than per projected. You, you and Jake will both be in the sin bin together. All right. <laughs> I'm looking forward to the notifications. <laughs> Zach, Zach, thank you so much again. Stay safe, my friend. We appreciate thank you, you coming too. on. Absolutely. Yep. So, man. Woo, OK, this was a bit of a long one. Thanks for bearing with us, everybody. Uh, uh, hey, guys, if, if you're still listening to us, give yourself a pat in the back. Maybe DM me, Jake. I'll buy you like a soda or something because you guys are real troopers having the, the two of us just talk your ears off. But can you blame us? We are so freaking excited that it is finally here. So on behalf of Jake and myself, uh, Zach earlier from SI, thank you so much for listening, guys. Thank you so much for following. Uh, make sure you follow us on Twitter, 
Uh, this video is going to be up on YouTube first before it goes up on uh, Apple and Spotify. If you ever want to get a little preview, it's always going to be on YouTube first and on the FUOwsNest.com uh, before it hits the streaming services. So thanks again, guys. Uh, we'll talk to you again next week, maybe with a win in our pocket in the entire college football world talking about FAU winning in paradise. We'll see. All right. Thanks, guys. Go Owls. Roll Owls.